Love that. Love that. So inspiring to see uh, just the youth today. And uh, I want to thank you, New Hope, because many of you were a part of helping Brooklyn reach that goal. And I think that uh, we all play a part in fulfilling miracles and promises of God. And so when God speaks something to a young person or to a youth group, you guys have been so faithful in helping that come to fruition. And I think that there's a real blessing. And I'm excited. I'm so excited uh, just for the future generations. I think uh, although we need um, some maturity and growing and growth, I believe that we're going to be in good hands someday. And uh, we're excited for that. Well, it is good to be with you this morning. And uh, thank you for coming out in the rain. You guys didn't melt. Um, and those joining online, glad that you are online with us in the warm comfort of your own living room uh, where I desire to be today with <laughs> slippers on and coffee in hand and everything. But uh, I get the privilege to, to kick off a new series uh, titled uh, Spiritual Warfare. Spiritual Warfare. First Peter 5.8 says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. I want to remind you, church, that Satan is very real, and he's coming against you and your family with everything he's got to steal, kill, and destroy you and your life and your faith. Many of us, I believe, live a distracted life trying to make a living, uh, trying to be a good person, or um, distracted with the luxuries and pleasures of life, and we simply forget that we are in a war, not against our neighbor, not against a political party, not against the government, not against our family. We are in a spiritual battle against Satan and his powers, and it's time that God's church wakes up, realizes it, and begins to engage in spiritual warfare. Um, the title of my message this morning is Reality Check because I believe that many of us need just that. We need to stand guard and not just flee and defend the attacks of Satan, but to begin to, to pick up and, and push the kingdom of God and push back the, the uh, darkness and the evil in this world. One of my biggest pet peeves in watching athletics is when a team has a lead in the fourth quarter and they just play not to lose. You guys know what I'm talking about? They're just like, stop advancing the ball down court. They stop taking risks. They stop pushing the ball down field. And, and it's just like, let's just hold on and not make any mistakes so that we can maybe uh, pull off this upset, but that we can pull off this win. It's like the life of a Baylor fan. The fourth quarter comes around and it's like, no, throw the ball, right? Church, hear me this morning. We need to advance the kingdom of God. We can't just hold on, just trying to make it until the Lord returns. We are called into a spiritual battle and we need to push back the evil and Satan so that we can advance the kingdom of God in this world. How many agree? You can turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 6 and to Mark chapter five. You can hold your finger into Mark chapter five. Um, at the close of my message, I'm gonna give opportunity for those who would like prayer to come forward to be uh, prayed for. I'm gonna encourage all of us to uh, live a life of prayer. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. And you ask God for a spirit to have the desire to pray. He will give you that heart. He will give you that desire. I believe that many of you have fasted throughout your life, and maybe you, you did and you've been out of the routine of fasting, but I think it's time that our church begins to make fasting a regular discipline in our lives, that we become spiritual warriors and, and we are aware of what's going around. I, I encourage you this week to pray for your, your house, Anoint your home in oil, the door frames of, of your house, and, and make it a place that says, God, you are welcome here. Your spirit is welcome here. I am declaring my house a place for God's spirit to dwell and to be in it, and, and Satan, you've got no power here. You've got no room here. And so I would encourage you, parents, anoint your kids' bedrooms in oil. Uh, anoint your homes in oil, and, and let's begin to engage in the spiritual warfare. Ephesians 5, um, we're looking at 6, but 5, Paul talks about how the church used to be in darkness, but now is in light. And um, he calls God's people to walk in love and in holiness. And now in Ephesians chapter 6, 
Paul is uh, summing up the entire book, and uh, in verse 10, he says this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. And Paul puts this so uh, clearly, and he just spells it out. Our fight is not against humans. We are in a spiritual war. Back in February, my wife Elizabeth uh, began to experience some pain in her ankle. And it started off pretty tolerable. Uh, She was able to manage it for a little bit, but it very quickly um, grew into intolerable where she's crawling around on her hands and knees because she can't put any weight on her ankle. But the thing that just confused us is that she hadn't twisted it, she hadn't fallen down the stairs, she didn't drop anything off of it. There wasn't any swelling. We had no idea where this pain, I'm thinking, are you faking? You just need some attention, baby? No, I didn't say that, but I may have thought it. She wouldn't do that. She's way tougher than me. I'm the wimp in the family, okay? Um, And so it gets to the point where she's like starting to feel nauseous uh, of how much pain she's in. And we're like, we should probably go to the doctor at this point. So we call a babysitter. We zip over to Methodist West. We go to the ER. Uh, Fortunately, they weren't busy that uh, night. And and they take her in. They do some blood work. They, They do some analysis. The doctor comes in. He goes, well, good news. We figured out what's going on you've got cellulitis in your ankle. Now, for those of you who don't know what cellulitis is, cellulitis is different than cellulite, okay? My wife does not have chubby ankles, okay? Cellulitis is an infection, and it can enter your body uh, through any open pore. So it could be through a cuticle, it could be through chapped lips, it could be through a piercing. It could, it could enter any open pore in your body. You can get this infection and then it settles wherever it decides to settle. It just happened to be in Elizabeth's ankle. The, the physician assistant uh, said, I got cellulitis one time and it rested on my nose. It was the most painful thing in, in my en- entire life that I've ever gone. So Uh, never get cellulitis if you can, which I don't know how Elizabeth got it. We don't, we don't know to this day. Um, But you wouldn't wish that on any, anybody. Now on a scale of one to 10, how crazy would it have been if I would have said, Elizabeth, your ankle is causing you so much grief in this moment. Let's just, let's just chop it off mid, mid calf and just be done with it. It would get rid of your pain, right? That would be absolutely nuts. That'd be like 11 out of 10, how crazy that that would be. You know, without first looking for the root of the the problem, you're not gonna just amputate off your ankle. Your ankle has purpose. Your ankle has value. Elizabeth's fight wasn't with her ankle. It was with the infection that lied within her ankle. Her ankle in and of itself wasn't the problem, it was the infection that was the problem. Hear me, church, this morning. Your boss, your coworker, your relative, your spouse, your ex, your friend, government leaders, whoever, they are not who you are at war with. It's the power of sin and evil and darkness that you are at war with. That person is God's beloved creation and that person was created for a purpose. But the problem and the reality is, is that they are not and cannot live uh, according to God's purpose for their life because they have a root issue and they live in bondage to sin and the powers of darkness. This morning I've got three points and I'm going to do my best to get through them as clearly and as concisely as possible. And the first thing I want you to realize is that there really are demons. There are really are demons. Now, when I was reading this to my kids, I've got a six, four, and three-year-old. I read my sermons to my kids because if a six-year-old can understand it, then surely you guys can understand it. Sam stops me at this point and he goes, Dad, you need a knock-knock joke in, in here right now. This, this is kind of boring. I said, really, Sam? Okay. So, well, what joke would you tell him? 
And then he proceeds to tell me, not a knock-knock joke, but Sam, you're going to watch this later because I told you and I gave you my word I would. But this is Sam's joke that he wanted me to tell you um, to spice things up. What did the person say to the robot who had died? Rust in peace. (laughs) So bad. So bad. So good. Sorry, Sam. (laughs) Uh, So, back to my... uh, sermon, there really are demons. The word demon is in the Bible 82 times, and uh, 61 of those 82 times it's found in the Gospels, where Jesus is directly dealing with and addressing the demons. And I'm amazed at the number of Christians that go to church that do not believe in demons, that they do not believe in demonic powers. Hear me, if we're reading about them in Scripture, if we read about them in ancient texts such as the Dead Sea Scrolls, and and we read about them and see them in other cultures, then why do we have such a hard time living in the reality that demonic forces and demons are real? Mark 5 records a story about a man possessed by demons. Let's read Mark uh, 5, verse 1. They, being Jesus and his disciples, they went across the lake to the region of Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man had lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, and he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Now, I want to make a comment here. I don't believe that it was the demon causing this man and controlling this man to cut himself. I believe that this man was in so much torment and so much agony from the influence of these demons in his life that he was trying to commit suicide. He was saying, it'd be better for me to be dead. And I I believe that the same spirits are tormenting people today and causing people to, to reach for desperate means and cutting. And and verse six, he says uh, says this, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. Let me ask you this. Do you think that a demon would intentionally draw closer to Jesus? No. So if you feel like you're being oppressed, let me tell you this, there is no power on earth that can keep you from running to Jesus. There is no power that can keep you from running from Jesus. And then verses seven and eight actually happen in reverse order. You'll see what I'm talking about. Verse seven, he shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, so Jesus had already said this to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. And then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on a nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. And he gave them permission. And the impure spirits came out of them, went into the pigs. And the herd of about 2,000 in number rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. Now, can you imagine witnessing this in person, right? You're on your lunch break and all of a sudden all this goes down. You go home to your family that night and you're like, guys, you will never guess what I witnessed on my break today. You remember Loco Joe that hangs out at the tombs, you know? Well, some guy just steps off a boat, comes up to him, casts a demon out of him, puts the demons in Bob's pigs, and Bob's pigs go and jump off of the cliff and kill themselves. Bob's ticked, but it was pretty awesome, right? Man, What a crazy thing to witness. And hear me, church, I fully believe that this happened. The Bible accurately describes this location with steep cliffs. See, everywhere else, if you've been to Israel, everywhere else around the Sea of Galilee or Lake Galilee is a gradual uh, grade down into into the lake, except for this one spot in this one pagan city that would have had pigs, right? I believe that this happened. Demons are real, they're really real. And we know that um, because in scripture, in Revelations chapter 12, it talks about when Satan was cast out of heaven by God, that he took a third of the angels with him. 
Now what happened to the third of those angels? Did they just cease to exist? No, they are Satan's followers, they are demons. A demon is this, it's, it's a disembodied spirit looking for a place to dwell. That's what a demon is, a disembodied spirit looking for a place to dwell. And if there aren't really demons, then we need to omit a lot of the Bible. We need to omit a lot of Jesus' ministry. You know why I think there's so much uh, recording of Jesus dealing with demonic activity in the New Testament? Because I think up until that time, demons had their way and there was no power on earth that could address them. This was amazing that this man had power over spirits. Demons and demonic powers are real. And the second thing I want you to realize is that they really do enter people. Matthew 8, verse 16 says, when evening came, many who were demon possessed were brought to him and he drove out the spirits with the word and healed all the sick. Matthew 9, 32 and 33 says, while they were going out, a man who was demon possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. Matthew 17, 18 says, Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. Mark 3, 14 and 15 says, he appointed the 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Mark 6, verse 12 and 13 says, they went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many people, uh, sick people with oil and healed them. We see in our text of Mark chapter five, a man who was possessed and I could read more and more scriptures that, that um, talk about demons entering people. I think you get the picture. Demons really do enter people. So you might be asking yourself this. Does that mean that a demon can possess a Christian? Does that mean that a demon can possess a Christian? And I think this is where we have to look to the Greek to understand what the phrase demon possessed actually means. The Greek word for demon possessed is demonai zomai. Say demonai zomai. Yeah, about half of you tried. It wasn't very good. Demonai meaning demon. Zomai meaning possessed. Demon possessed. Demonai zomai. I think uh, this is a pretty good translation, although probably a more literal translation would be demonized, but this is a good translation. Um, but we need to understand what it means to be possessed. Now there are two Greek words for possession. One means ownership, to own something. The use of the word in these scriptures is not the word for ownership. Okay, this word, zomai, literally means to gain mastery over. In other words, zomai means to gain control over or to have power over. I think we even uh, use this in the English language the same way that the Greek used uh, this, um, the, the Greek language used this. How many ever had a mom, or maybe now it's a spouse, that would ask you this question growing up? What in the world would possess you to do a thing like that? Anybody ever hear that, right? What in the world would possess you to say a thing like that, right? Did mama mean what in the world owns you to do a thing like that? No, mama meant what in the world would influence you to do a thing like that? What in the world would control you to do a thing like that? You guys following with me? So can a Christian be owned by a demon? No, they cannot be owned. We are owned by God and bought with a price, amen? But can a Christian be under the control of a demon. Let me read to you another translation of this word, demonai zomai, in Thayer's Greek to English lexicon, which is a real uh, killer. You should read it all the time. It's amazing. Um, this lexicon of the New Testament defines this word as to be under the power of a demon. Demonai zomai. To be under the power of a demon. 
to be under the power or control or mastery of a demon. Now imagine with me for a moment that a man, we'll just say a, a Christian man, imagine with me that a Christian man decides to drink alcohol and he, he begins to drink a large consumption of an alcoholic beverage for whatever reason. Does that alcohol own that man? No, it doesn't own him. But is the alcohol in that man? Absolutely. And as long as there is alcohol in that man, does the alcohol have control or influence over that man? You better believe it. What happens is that a person does something or says something that is very out of character and then later regrets it. And it was the decision, hear me church, it was the decision to drink that opened the door for the alcohol to enter his body and then have influence over him. So imagine with me that a Christian man begins to look at pornography. You're opening a door to the enemy and he will enter in. He won't own you, but he will be in you. And you will be under the influence and the control of him until you get him out. Now this man, this father, this husband, maybe a grandfather, he might be a really good person, but he will be led to doing something out of character that shocks him and everyone else that knows him that leaves a trail of regret and pain. Why? Because he was under the influence of a spirit that he opened a door to. Ask yourself this morning, is there a sin in your life that you just can't seem to get over. You've asked God for forgiveness a million different times. God, I promise I'll never do that again. Forgive me. Is there a sin in your life that has been a part of your life for five, 10, 15, 20, maybe decades of years? Do you have an area in your life that Satan has a stronghold you find yourself and you're realizing in this moment that you are in bondage. This isn't just a lack of discipline. There is a stronghold in your life. Could it be that you have opened a door for a spirit to influence you? There really are demons. They really do enter people but here's the good news. Jesus really does cast them out. Hear me, if you feel like you've got a problem, don't be dis depressed or discouraged because I know the person who can set you free. His name is Jesus and he is more than enough. The Bible says that greater is he that is in you. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We can be overcomers. We don't have to live in bondage. We don't have to live in fear. We can be set free. And if you've come in here and you realize that you've got a stronghold in your life, there is an area that you are in bondage, you can be set free. I want you to look at the scriptures that we read earlier and you notice every time Jesus encounters a demon, what he does. Matthew 8, and he drove out the spirits with a word. All it takes is a word and he healed the sick. Matthew 9, and when the demon was driven out. Matthew 17, and it came out of the boy and he was healed. Mark 3, he appointed them to have authority to drive out demons. Mark 6, they drove out many demons and healed them. Jesus can set you free for there is power in his name. And I think that the more you dive into God's word, the more you begin to study God's word, your depression and your uh, disappointment about where you're at in life and, and, and where it is, there's no room for that because we see hope in Jesus.
And, and as you digest the word of God, you'll start to believe that what Jesus was doing back then, he's doing today and he'll do for you and he's gonna do it in the future. He's gonna do that, grandma, for your grandson. He's gonna do that, wife, for your spouse. He's gonna do that, teenager, for you. Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. And we have been commissioned and sanctioned by God and given that same authority. If you came in here and you're realizing, man, I might have, I might be influenced. I'm not owned, I'm not owned, I'm Christian, I'm saved, but I might have influence in my life. Jesus wants you to be free this morning. Would you stand with me all across this room? Close your eyes. You know, you can only be set free if you're willing to admit and acknowledge that you are in bondage. It's like, it's like AA 101, it's like the first step. Realizing your condition, where you're at. Every eye closed, head bowed. This is a time to tune out all distractions, to allow the Spirit of God to reveal the deepest, darkest parts of your heart that maybe nobody else knows. And I, I wanna speak to the people that have been in uh, church for a long time the spirit of pride might be bubbling up saying, man, I, I, I can't come down and get prayer because I teach Sunday school. I'm a deacon, I'm a pastor, I'm a leader. What will my kids think of me? What will my spouse think of me? Listen, it doesn't matter what they think. It matters to get set free. And you might be being set free from gluttony. You might be uh, being set free from, uh, from an addiction of some, court, some kind. You might be uh, being set free from a spirit of anger and temper. So Jesus, right now, as you just begin to speak to every heart, everyone watching online, everyone in this building, I pray, God, that we would begin to have our eyes opened to the war that we are in, that you would help us identify areas that we need to surrender to you. And God, as we surrender those things to you, we ask that in your name, the name above all names, Jesus Christ, our King, that you would come and you would set the captive free. I pray, God, that, that things that have been held onto for far too long would be released least in the name of Jesus. I pray that there would be freedom in the name of Jesus. And as we surrender to you, we say, God, in our hearts, in our minds, God, we just want more. Fill us up, God. Fill me up, Jesus. I want more of you. I pray, God, that, that every room and every person's heart would be completely full of you, leaving no room for temptation or, or the enemy, God. So we just declare our spirits, our hearts to be set free in this moment. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. In just a moment, I'm gonna invite those that are feeling like, man, I'm just caught in some sort of bondage. I need to be set free. Maybe you would like to come down here and you say, I've got a son or I've got a daughter, I've got a grandchild, I've got a relative, I've got a friend. We had a lot of those in the early service where you're gonna stand in the gap for them. Let, let me hear you, let me tell you this and, and may you hear this. Your prayers make a difference. Your intercessory and praying will make a difference. They do not fall on deaf ears, like the ears of, of idols made by man. They fall on the living God who is alive and Jesus is sitting right by his side right now, listening to our prayers. And so if that's you and you say, man, I've got someone in my life or maybe it's myself, I want you to come and I'm gonna count to three. One. come right now as we sing this song. We believe that and we plead the blood of Jesus over our children, over our grandchildren, God. May this church rise up, not just as a wimpy Christian, God, but one that is full of your spirit, full of power, and you would send us into the darkness. And God, as we leave these doors, that the enemy would run screaming, begging for their lives, just, I pray, God, right now that we would walk in the authority of Jesus Christ in your name and what you've done, Jesus. So we just ask more of your kingdom here on this earth. We need more of you demonstrated in our life, God. And we know that our salvation comes from no one or no thing except through Jesus Christ. So 
Today, God, we put our faith in you. We put our faith and trust and our obedience in you for what you've done. I pray for anyone here this morning or anyone watching online that needs to place their trust and they're put their heart into your hands. I pray that they would just repeat this prayer right now. Jesus, enter my heart today. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Put my feet on a path of righteousness, God. Renew my mind. Renew my spirit. Allow me to love the things of heaven and not the things of earth, God. Forgive me of my sin, and I call and confess and believe that, Jesus, you are the only way to heaven. And so let my life live in a representation of that belief and that conviction. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 We are in a war, church. Some of you parents, hear me? You need to wake up. You need to become more serious. Some of you grandparents need to stop being lazy. You need to spend more time discipling your grandchildren and not just giving them candy and and sugar and, and fun activities. Amen? Your prayers matter. I don't know if I mentioned this in this service or not. Sometimes they blend together. But Jack Hayford says, said it this way. He said, do do we need discipleship? Which is discipline in our life. Do we need discipleship? Or do we need deliverance? The answer is yes. We need them both. Why? Because you cannot disciple a demon, but you can't cast out the flesh. You can't disciple a demon, but you can't cast out a flesh. And so there's a partnership with your flesh that comes with discipline. Matthew, Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, it's better for you to pluck it out than to lose your entire soul to hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, it's better for you to chop it off. So there's an element of discipline, but there is also an element of discipleship. So may God's presence and his peace be with you. May his face shine upon you. May you walk not in fear, but knowing that the the battle has been won. And we have victory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you go. We'll see you next week. Come back tonight. Pastor Luke's kicking off a series on the armor of God, and we're excited to hear that. And spend ample time in prayer with your family uh, and friends. God bless you.